Yeah. So, uh, hello, dear guests, dear participating students. I'd like to thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Jakub Frank, and together with Bara Kundrachikova, uh, we are curators of Olomouc Museum of Art and the CEFO uh, Central European Art Forum in Olomouc. I'm also a curator and chief editor of Central European Art Database, and together with Dushan Borok, I co-organize the New Media Museums project. This is the second session of the New Media Art and Archives Seminar uh, that will focus on the position of an artist in the discourse of new media arts and their role in the collecting, archiving, preserving and exhibition practice in the communication with the institutions, curator, or collector, etc. Uh, let me first shortly introduce the speakers of today's session. Uh, the first speaker here is Attila Churge, a Hungarian intermediate artist currently living and working in Warsaw. Uh, then we still don't have here Mikhail Bielicki, uh, who I believe will join us shortly. Um, Mikhail is a pioneering figure in the new media and video art in Czech Republic, uh, currently living in Prague and Düsseldorf. So let's hope he will join us. Uh, let's hope the next speaker, who is Jana Bernartova, will also join us, but uh, here we have some materials from her that we will show uh, in case she doesn't, uh, because she's opening an exhibition, uh, her, her exhibition today in Strasbourg. So uh, we'll see, hopefully she will join us at least for the uh, final discussion. Uh, the last speaker here is Pavel Janicki, a Polish new media artist and a curator currently living and working in Wroclaw. Uh, also, we have a moderator of discussion here, Dusan Barok, a new media researcher and a long-time active figure in the field of digital curating and archiving. Welcome. And now I can see Michal Bielicki. Welcome, Michal. Uh, Sorry, Michal, can we just check hello. your microphone? Ah, yeah. Hello, hello. Sorry for being a little bit late. Perfect. Uh, we've just started. Uh, so the schedule and the progress of the session will be the same as it was last week. So there will be a short discussion after each presentation. However, we will try to stick to the required length of the presentation so that we have enough time for the final discussion in the end of the session. Uh, of course, we encourage the students to participate in the discussion and also if there are any questions from the public watching us on Facebook or YouTube, uh, we will also try to check the comment sections below the streams and, and answer them. So do not he hesitate to uh, reach us. Mm. Anyway, let me start this session with a short introduction to the topic. Uh, that will try to set the basis for the further discussion. Um, however, note that this presentation will obviously show a different and almost opposite position than the one of an artist. That is the topic of today's, since I'm here as a representative of an institution uh, of Olomouc Museum of Art. Uh, so let me just share my presentation with you. I hope you can see it now. Yes. Good. Yes, we see the presentation. Perfect. Mm, so, just very briefly, uh, so that we can get to the more interesting presentation of, of our artist here. Uh, in the last years, the museum has moved closer than ever before towards systematic collecting of new media artworks. Uh, however, we are still at the very beginning and without an extensive financial support from the government uh, that would allow the acquisition and the proper care for major artworks, creating a representative collection of new media art won't be possible. In last year, the curators of Olomouc Museum of Art extended the field of interest of Central European Art Database towards new medial, intermedial and digital art research and initiated a follow-up 
new media museums uh, with the aim to share know-how and create a platform for possible for finding possible solutions for particular issues connected uh, to the care for new media artworks. One of the important news is also the contemporary art and new media interventions in temporary exhibitions with the intention to acquire these temporary and site-specific installations in the collections. Last but not least, there is this present course that leads us to better understand different approaches and positions of the actors of the new media art world. Uh, all the, uh, yeah, this is of course the museum and its future project, uh, Central European Art Forum. Uh, this is the graphics of the project I just presented. Uh, all the above mentioned has led the museum to consider founding a new collection of intermedial, intermedial art. Although it may seem as a reverse process of founding a collection without proper artworks to include, we see it on the contrary as an opportunity to outline and develop functional methods and satisfactory conditions for acquisitions, evidence, preservations and uh, display of the artworks, as well as uh, possibly equal partnership with the artists. Uh, as I have mentioned in the last session's discussion, the main issue why the museum resigned from uh, collecting the new media was the lack of knowledge in preserving, preserving these artworks. Since the state museums take responsibility and legal liability for the artworks, the preservation of the artworks become the biggest drawback for the acquisition. So, clearly this applies for two pieces in the collection of Olomouc Museum of Art. Mm, and this is uh, Spiral by Stanislav Zippe and Symbion by uh, Federico Diaz. I'm not sure if it's just me, but I can I can still only see your first screen. Mm, okay. Uh, just give me a second, please. Yeah, now we now now you see now you see the okay so I will I will stay in this in this view. So again, uh, the logo of New Media Museum, the spiral by Stanislav Zipper that I just mentioned, and Federico Diaz Sembion. Um, from today's perspective, uh, it seems that. If these works were treated with more specific care and with more attention to the artist at the moment of the acquisition, we could have avoided certain installation and conservation issues that now became an integral part of them. For Spiral, that is the problem of replacing the original engine of the work. Um, for a new one, for Sembian, it is the problem of obsolescence of the software. I believe that if there was broader knowledge of dealing with new media artworks at the moment of acquisition, we could either avoid problems connected with installing the artworks by setting specific rules and manuals for handling the artworks, or we could have decided not to acquire the artwork uh, just for being uh, too challenging for preservation and installation in uh, the museum's conditions. Uh, so the specific cases with um, uh, with these two artworks were uh, in spiral uh, before or in the process of the acquisition when the museum uh, acquired the acquisition straight from the author from Stanislav Zipe. Uh, the, the artwork uh, was shown uh, in um, in a National Gallery Prague uh, where. Uh, the work got destroyed, the engine that moves the spiral, that moves the, the, the cable, uh, which makes like the kinetic, um, kinetic sculpture move, uh, broke down and uh, couldn't be uh, or uh, had, had to be replaced. And in communication with Stanislav Zippe, uh, the curators of Olomouc Museum of Art couldn't find a um, uh, any specific demands for for uh, replacing the engine so in the end um, so in the end the engine was replaced by a photocopier machine engine uh, but 
if uh, this was uh, somehow stated at the uh, even before the acquisition process, if there was a manual uh, by the artist, if there was um, specific rules how to handle the artwork, uh, we would have to we would um, avoid certain problems when installing and and uh, handling the artwork itself. With Federico Diaz Sembion, um, the specific case is different because uh, Sembion is a is a digital piece. It's a software-based artwork, and since it was created in 2003, and it is actually an application, a software uh, for interactive presentation, um, and uh, also for create creation of, of let's say, uh, this specific 3D print. Um, the software, of course, obsolete, uh, gets outdated, and uh, this brings, uh, of course, uh, major issues when handling this artwork in the collection, because uh, nowadays uh, the museum simply has uh, a very big problems with showing the artwork um, making the artwork almost unpresentable currently. Uh, on the other hand, we have a we have a um, new case, new case study here. And since the New Media Museums project started in 2020, or uh, this was the, that was the moment when we started thinking about the project. With its main objective being finding solutions for collecting and preserving new media art, we have made a major progress in terms of consultation with artists before the acquisition itself and also during and after it, meaning uh, at the time when the artwork is already in the collection and um, yeah, and so on. Uh, this helped us prepare an individual approach for the artwork of Roman Stekina that was acquired last year and it led to a more informed handling of the artwork. So uh, the, uh, the piece itself consists of uh, this print and it was created for, uh, for exhibition. It's one of these temporary uh, interventions for to exhibition by Jiri Kolar. And it consists of this um, one paperwork, which is an appropriation uh, of uh, the collage, collages, collages. And uh, the main piece, the new media piece, is um, a sound work that was basically just played back uh, at the installation. I don't know if you can hear it now. Babylon. Babylon. Vyslovení osudu. 52. Textogramy. So shortly, uh, it is a it is a piece that uh, draws from the um, from the text written by Ricolage uh, in the album Babylonia, and it is uh, narrated by uh, Miroslav Burianek, um, radio director, and uh, then the sounds of the clicking mouse and so on. That's a a sound of um, editing by Roman Stekina. So this is actually a, a very simple sound piece that is a, that is a, yes works as a, as a intervention to the to the exhibition and as a uh, can be exhibited with the collages uh, Babylona. So when acquiring this artwork, uh, we already knew or had some uh, some information or of how to treat this new media artworks and also the approach of the artist uh, helped us uh, a lot uh, because the artist being an intermediate artist uh, of course uh, has 
some knowledge of uh, how to how to offer his artworks to the collections. So he uh, prepared this case for the for the hard disk. Um, of course, uh, an integral part of the piece is a certificate. Um, that's just now probably a standard for for all data based pieces. But then there are also there's also a manual uh, manual and uh, there is this uh, I always forgot the name bill of um, uh, bill of materials they call it or like the uh, the list of of um, the uh, files that are that are part of the of the piece and. Yeah, then there's the manual for uh, displaying the artwork or exhibiting the artwork and uh, information uh, about, the, about the title of the artwork or how it should be uh, shown uh, at the exhibition. So this is in the end the, the piece, how it, uh, how it comes as an acquisition to our collection. Um, so this is basically uh, like a good case study or good um, practice how um, a specific artwork can be treated and uh, we're still at the very beginning and on the run we'll still find more issues with uh, for example evidence inventory and administration of the artwork but also for example backups of the data and so on and so on so um, yeah, that's it. I just uh, wanted to set the ground from the position of the institution, and now I would like to um, give my word to give word to Attila Cherge, uh, who will show us his position as an artist uh, of new media artworks and so on. So thank you. Thank you. Um. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation, and I'm very glad of the opportunity. I can say some words about my positions and uh, some reflections uh, on this problem. Yes? Until I find I find it. I forgot about the very important thing. If you can. Sorry? If I can. If you can. Of your mic for time. your mic for time. Ah, this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so sorry, I, I forgot to introduce Attila properly. So Attila Cherge uh, was born in 1965. He studied at the Academy of Fine Arts in Budapest, painting and intermedia faculty, uh, and Riks Academy in Amsterdam. His works explore adjoining territories of art and science. He makes experiments with carefully engineered devices of his own design with cameras and optical apparatuses, uh, investigations attesting to a mindset that is playful and humorous, as well as philosophical. Uh, with the often surprising and amusing experiments, he tries to create and visualize motions and phenomena that are imperceptible for the human eye. He assembles his objects, which almost function like representations of rules of geometry from everyday objects and materials, which he places in unusual situations. Spreading out objects in two dimensions or representing dimensions hidden from the human eye with their duality of dynamism and stillness result in very spectacular works. Chorgo has featured at prominent international exhibitions and art fairs. In 1999, he represented Hungary at the nation's pavilion at the Venice Biennale. In 2001, he was awarded the Munkachi Prize. He participated at the Istanbul Biennale in 2003 and the Biennale of Sydney in 2008. His Mebius space earned what is one of the most important European recognitions in media art, the Namjoon Pike Award. <laughs> Thank you, Atil. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I must apologize for my noise. <laughs> Probably you hear, I, I don't hear it. Uh, sorry. Uh, I will make a short presentation. Actually, this is a cocktail uh, of works, uh, not chronological, but uh, there are some relations between the works. Uh, 
And uh, when I was thinking about uh, this uh, frame, a new media art, I uh, realized that my position is a very old new media art. <laughs> so going back to the origin of this new media art, we must find something at the uh, 16th, 17th uh, century, when the telescope and the microscope and uh, such stuff were invented. Galilei uh, allegedly uh, invented the uh, telescope for seeing remote things, and the microscope made a huge cultural shock that time that uh, turned out uh, there are beings uh, not perceptible for us uh, only with uh, mechanical tools or optical tools. And I think uh, since this time we are on the same track, more or less, uh, and uh, new media art is also uh, mm, uh, find the roots uh, uh, there. And uh, I myself uh, also uh, worked a lot with optical devices, like cameras, uh, Jakub mentioned, and so on. So there are a lot of photography uh, uh, in my portfolio uh, made by normal fabric in factory made cameras and my own, own uh, devices as well other uh, optical illusions, because the illusion became uh, very important in that period and uh, yeah, and remained uh, still important. So where is this? I'm sorry. I hope you see this uh, PowerPoint. Yes, good. Uh, <laughs> so I start with an old work, uh, slanting water. Uh, and uh, this is a typical, um, I like to uh, start with this work because it's, typical, uh, it's uh, characteristic for my uh, uh, problems and how I work that uh, there is a vision uh, and I try to elaborate uh, this vision. So my vision was uh, uh, water uh, in cups and glasses uh, have uh, Mm, not a regular uh, situation, not regular water level as uh, usually we see in the kitchen, but uh, the water is slanting. Uh, and uh, I made a special apparatus or device uh, for this that uh, the uh, glasses are mounted to a turning table and because of the rotation, uh, the liquid uh, in the caps uh, became uh, slanting. And uh, this is a situation we can't see with, uh, your, with our naked eyes. Uh, we can't uh, sit at a table. Uh, or we, we could sit like the Soviet astronauts were trained in uh, such a centrifuge, but uh, probably we <laughs> wouldn't enjoy the situation. Uh, but the camera uh, co-rotating with the caps uh, can uh, record uh, this uh, special spatial, spatial situation. It's not a trick, uh, it's uh, an unusual situation, but part, of, of course, part of the physical reality. Uh, here, the, only the photo is the piece. Uh, that uh, the, the construction with the rotation, rotating disc and so on is, um, yeah, I don't know where it is. <laughs> uh, similar um, form, or shape, or object, uh, another cup. Uh, two long screws are mounted to a, to a motor, and uh, electric motor, and illuminated by spotlight. And uh, because of the uh, fast uh, velocity, we can't see uh, the sticks uh, sorry, uh, separately, but we see a rotation uh, solid, a uh, kind of cup. And uh, this is also a part of uh, the media art problem that uh, the illusion or what we can see, what not, uh, 
the, the limit of the perception, uh, yeah, this is a, a, a real problem. And a lot of artists uh, try to base works on it. Here, uh, back to Jakub's uh, problem with the engines, uh, I had some uh, problems with the motors, but it's, it's in a, co a little collection in Hungary, and uh, little collections are quite flexible, uh, and uh, they called me to do something with, and uh, I brought a new engine, and uh, yeah, that's all. But a uh, few years ago, I uh, was in Hamburg in the Kunsthalle, and uh, um, I learned that they have a very strict and rigid, uh, and probably this is the correct way, uh, so a rigid uh, policy. Uh, if a work enters the museum, uh, artists can't touch it anymore uh, because it's in the museum, the museum is responsible for it, and uh, artists uh, like to make changes, <laughs> so it will be, lose the authenticity in a certain way. Uh, so artists, uh, hands off, uh, don't touch the works. And uh, here another uh, liquid work uh, with engine oil, motor oil used in cars. Uh, it's uh, 45 liters and it's rotating and making a, a big uh, rotating mirror. Master project is the title, and uh, it comes from an Edgar Allan Poe uh, short story. Uh, and uh, because the uh, on this drawing, uh, you can see that uh, mm, that uh, black uh, like diagrams. It shows how the well, uh, the surface of the oil will be changed. Uh, depending on the of the actual velocity uh, in the beginning it's flat like a normal liquid in a cup and in the end it's a very deep uh, parabolic mirror of course it makes an effect of mirroring and uh, it's at the beginning it gives a magnified image uh, disappears the image comes back, but uh, reversed, it's getting smaller and smaller, uh, and almost uh, <laughs> disappearing. Uh, and uh, visitors can switch it on and off, uh, so experiencing these uh, two phases that uh, then the uh, image disappears and the image comes back uh, from, like from a cave, uh, from very remote uh, uh, place. It has also some problems with exhibit. Uh, flammable material. Um, there were situations then uh, the director had to take the responsibility uh, with written way <laughs> that uh, um, allows uh, the, this piece uh, for the exhibition. If something happens, then um, yeah, this is a responsibility of the director because it's a flammable material. So it's, um, yeah, it's a special, special, special situation. But uh, not some, inti some institutions doesn't, doesn't care with this uh, problem that is flammable. Others are very uh, mm, yeah, rigid. And uh, yeah. we can see many, many differences uh, uh, it's not so immediate, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, here I will show this uh, photo project. I made a, a camera, and uh, mm, you, uh, this is uh, what you see in the uh, pictures. They are uh, celestial globes, uh, celestial um, uh, spheres, celestial globes, uh, showing the stars in the sky, and. Uh, you know, we know that the stars are very far, and uh, some of them are more near, or others are more far, so they are uh, different in distances. But we can uh, show them on a, a sphere, 
and uh, we could do the same uh, thing uh, with our environment. Uh, we could make a photo, a spherical one, which uh, shows everything around uh, in your room where you are now, or here in my, my studio, or outside. So we, we can uh, determine these uh, provisional spheres. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, I made the attempts to realize this uh, idea. And uh, I worked uh, in different pieces uh, on this uh, topic, but uh, one of them is this orange space. And uh, if you peel an orange, you get a double spire. And uh, this is uh, actually a, a strange image uh, of a spheric entity. Uh, a curve uh, like like a circle, just three dimensional. So it makes a big transformation with a very simple method, and uh, it impressed me very much. And uh, I made a camera. Uh, inside the camera, this uh, sphere is rotating, uh, co-rotating uh, with the space, and uh, everything uh, in the space around the camera could be recorded to. Uh, this is the analog camera, uh, black and white uh, photo paper. And uh, this is laid out as an orange skin. This is put together to sphere. It has an interesting uh, um, reverse uh, connection to the original sphere, because the sphere normally is around us, always around us, embracing that. And here we see the space uh, from an outer point of view as an object. And this is a untypical position. And this is an action. It's not a user-friendly camera. Many things must be done. Regula regulating uh, with a small DC motor, always measuring the light. So it's a... Uh, it has a lot of things to do with the uh, old analog uh, photography. And uh, this was this exhibition uh, you mentioned in the in Cologne, in Köln, in the what uh, was in the Varsity Art Museum, and uh, this camera was exhibited. Another one uh, together with the old. Uh, uh, 17th century uh, Dutch paintings, and uh, there were a lot of um, instruments, devices, the telescopes, camera obscura boxes, and so on uh, in these rooms. They are not in the film. But it was very interesting uh, because normally we exhibit in uh, contemporary museums or institutions. It's not, it's for uh, classical art. Uh, but somehow this uh, media art problem, what I tried to uh, describe shortly, this uh, origin of the media art, <laughs> uh, I f could feel that uh, there were a lot of similarities. Uh, how is the time? Uh, I have to, oh, okay, 10 minutes more. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the problem of the maps. Uh, the making maps uh, had also a big boom uh, in this uh, centuries of uh, 16th century uh, because of this uh, uh, geographical um, discoveries, uh, America, and so uh, it was necessary to have a better uh, image uh, about the globe. And uh, the right one is very interesting uh, this is a uh, it, it's uh, older it's from the ninth, uh, 19th century end of 19th century made by Peirce uh, Charles Sanders Peirce was, was a American philosopher and uh, it's very interesting like uh, artist problems that the equator in inside this uh, map is a, a square and uh, mathematically he transformed this uh, it's a very comp uh, complicated uh, mathematics. And, uh, is an 
another map, uh, August map from Germany, and I used to my studio this uh, map. You can see on the upper uh, corner, or oh, corner, it has no corner, but <laughs> uh, uh, this uh, blue spots, they are uh, tape, uh, tapes on the ceiling. And from a certain position, it becomes a square. It's a kind of anamorphosis, but the anamorphic point is uh, the logic of the cartography, uh, the equations uh, used by that kind of map projection. In the reality, it looks like this, but in this situation of cartography, it turns to regular. So it was very... Um, uh, this, this kind of programs were very uh, inspiring that uh, what is regular, what is irregular, what is the transition between them. And uh, uh, like in these pieces, uh, this occurrence graphs, you see this uh, road, the two disks uh, with these white stripes. If they rotate, if it rotates, then uh, the intersection of these stripes make a, a circle inside. If you switch it off, then uh, again you see these curvatures. Or here, you can't predict what it would do uh, if cooperating, but it makes an infinity sign and turn off. Um, it has also some. Um, mm, technical uh, issues that uh, the lamp is, um, uh, there, there is a okay the lamp is not so important because uh, we have uh, now led lamps so they are not so like before but uh, giving enough light if it's uh, then uh, it has uh, motors the motors are quite stable but after a while they will yeah, have problems and there are these uh, belts. Uh, they are the most uh, problematic parts. Uh, these driving belts, uh, the drag for the transmission of the energy. Yeah? Uh, and uh, they must be changed time to time. Uh, I never thought that uh, they eat it, uh, so many belts up. <laughs> but it's uh, cheap. We can buy in the shop. <laughs> Still, uh, this uh, technology exists, so it's okay. It can be done without the artist. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing. Or, but these pieces are much more comp much more problematic. They are the most problematic uh, works. Uh, this. Uh, uh, based on uh, the platonic solids uh, and uh, with a very low technology. That was uh, by purpose uh, using low technology and uh, sticks uh, with connected with strings uh, going to a motor and driven by a mechanism. Everything is transparent uh, that uh, visitors uh, can see every detail. But uh, they are so complex uh, and so many directions and so many little elements that uh, and so fine uh, adjusted that uh, it makes sometimes difficulties. Uh, I made five constructions. Five constructions based on this principle. This is a bigger one. And uh, some of them are in museums. And uh, uh, I am happy only with one museum. Uh, it's in Luxembourg, uh, in Mudam. And uh, they know very well what to do with the work if a uh, um, problem appears. And sometimes they exhibit it without me because the team uh, knows uh, everything, how to set up and, uh, and so on. And um, so this is what I mentioned that uh, the this chaotic character of the works. Uh, if you stop the machine, it can be switched off any time. Uh, in a position like this, you don't know what is regular, what is irregular. But uh, 
after it comes to a icosahedron, so becomes explicitly regular again, and going back to uh, to the three shapes. So this other animation, this is in the Mudam collection. It's not so fast, it's uh, just an uh, animation. The big dodecahedron is made from uh, uh, little three uh, other platonic solids. So you can imagine here there are many frictions and such things, and uh, the strings, mainly the strings, will uh, uh, they must be changed after a while. And, uh, well, I show only one piece. Uh, this is a clockwork from a larger series. I made a lot of clockworks, and these clockworks are based on that principle that uh, there is the three-dimensional shape uh, which has two regular uh, views, uh, an infinity sign from one um, view and uh, a circle from the other one. So imagine then on a cylinder, uh, an infinity sign is uh, drawn. And uh, there is a clock like mechanism in, inside with two motors uh, coordinated with sensors uh, um, yeah, also and uh, with parabolic mirrors illuminated. And uh, Yeah, this is also, um, it works quite reliable, but uh, it's not an old one. And uh, at every work, uh, which is uh, in motion, it, it's, uh, it's crucial, this reliability and durability. <laughs> they have a limited, uh, limited uh, I don't say life, but um, they need, uh, need care, I mean, they need care. Like, like your car, uh, which was made in a factory, it, it must be uh, <laughs> repaired all the time. So imagine that uh, artwork uh, made in a poor studio of an artist <laughs> is uh, yeah, it needs more, 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 more patience and more care and more, uh, more love. <laughs> That's it. And um, okay, uh, I think that was the uh, and that was the presentation I wanted to show you. And uh, this is a uh, uh, what I sent uh, to you, Jakub, and I think uh, it landed at the students. Uh, the short uh, um, blog uh, with uh, Moholy Knight's uh, famous work, the Light Space Modulator. Also, he had the same problems that uh, he had a genial. Uh, artwork, but technically uh, he couldn't uh, achieve it. And later, uh, after his death, uh, uh, it was remade uh, by uh, the galleries. And uh, it's also a possible, uh, it's a solution. Uh, okay, that's, thank you. It's, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dushan, Dushan, can you, you maybe, maybe <laughs> after after yeah. turns of his uh, yeah, good. Thank you so much, Attila. It was very interesting to go through some of your works. Uh, yeah, one can really see the <clears throat> like the artistic signature and uh, maybe also like evolution of uh, thinking and seeing, looking at things. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe before, I mean, I have a couple of questions, but but uh, I would maybe ask first if anyone has any uh, comments or uh, questions on uh, <clears throat> about Attila's presentation. Please go ahead. <clears throat> 
Yeah, if not, uh, um, uh, you or Pavel has. Can I? Yes, please. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I have a comments. Uh, that was really, really impressive presentation. Thank you very much. Or rather, words are impressive. So maybe that's that's better. And. Uh, I was thinking about one uh, one issue because you Attila you uh, uh, introduced uh, let's say your um, workshop as something which is um, related on old days of media art but from my point of view it is actually a future of media art because when when I see that this a, a lot of um, topic which was you know explored really heavily during last decades uh, like uh, software for example which is now the probably software now is in the same situation the video was on beginning on the century that was in, of course that will be still many many fantastic works based on software but let's say it's in some way it's a closed topic but from the from the other hand, we can clearly see that some, uh, let's say, of the grid technologies, especially in art, has really strong potential and they are timeless. So the, 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 the works created on the basis of those technologies or even maybe infrastructure or, or ideas actually are um, much better um, keeping the message through time than uh, the based on the so-called new new media new 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 media yeah uh, <laughs> yeah it's, it's a difficult thing that uh, what is because no, we are talking now uh, related to the to museum and the archive and so on but if artists do things then uh, it's not so important. I, I hope it's not important. <laughs> they don't work for museums uh, by excellence yeah, uh, with the intention that it must be there. So they can use any uh, artist, can use any um, techniques, technologies, uh, not durable, not good, but it's, it can be good for that point when it was made and shown. And uh, it has another logic uh, that what is uh, the problem of the museums and uh, uh, collections and uh, how we want to preserve uh, what people made, mankind made, or I don't know what. <laughs> so they are diverging back uh, on many cases. Yeah. Yes, yes. <coughs> you mentioned uh, you had a. Uh, a good experience with this museum in Luxembourg. Can you uh, maybe expand on this? What was what was? Uh, why do you think this is the case uh, that this particular institution could care better for your works? Was it about kind of a certain personnel, or was it about kind of different workflows, or uh, some, some something else? Yeah, 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 yeah. The personnel, yeah, like the the human factor. <laughs> But we can't <laughs> uh, exclude. Uh, this is uh, this is this is the reason. It has a new, quite new team. Uh, the museum is not so old, and I don't remember exactly, but it's less than 20 years. Uh, um, and uh, the team is uh, quite uh, enthusiastic. They made videos, interviews, photos, and so on. Uh, and one guy uh, uh, who has a good uh, hand and uh, sees the problems, and uh, this is uh, this is the this, this together. Uh, yeah. Because I have, a, so for example, in another collection, I have a similar piece, but a more simple one. And for a while, I saw that uh, somebody changed other kind of strings that were in the machine, for example. So somebody uh, did something with uh, the work, maintained, uh, it could operate and so on, and but left the museum. And uh, nobody mm, no, no, nobody uh, could uh, yeah. 
solve the, 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 the problems after. So it's not, uh, it's not so evident because these problems are not in the main um, way or add, uh, what are the problems uh, with this with the um, contemporary artworks. Yeah, we yeah, had we uh, had uh, um, a week ago. We had a session about uh, with uh, 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 people from different archives, but also from uh, from museum. There was a there was a Patricia uh, Falcao from um, Tate, where she said they have eleven uh, staff of eleven people who are uh, really employed to do uh, media uh, conservation, media restoration. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, it should be said that uh, in Europe there is uh, maybe only a handful or uh, I don't know, uh, probably not more than 10 museums uh, who employ really a uh, media conservator, a person with, uh, let's say, some kind of experience in uh, art restoration uh, slash conservation and, and uh, kind of technical media. So this is uh, like this little field is uh, kind of slowly growing, but uh, this is also a challenge we're facing in our kind of research projects, uh, project with uh, museums in Central Europe, where <clears throat> where there is there is uh, yeah there is a very like a big leg of uh, personal or maybe expertise um, uh, from the side of conservators in these kind of works. So we're also looking into maybe alternative uh, uh, ways that, uh, you know, like there would be uh, IT department more involved in uh, handling with art objects. But uh, this is also uh, very, um, yeah, uh, I mean, it's different to set up, let's say, a computer network or uh, install software for uh, people in the museum than to work with an, uh, with an art object. So there are kind of different responsibilities. And uh, yes, so I wonder, like in this Luxembourg Museum, is, is this a person, is, uh, what is the position of the person? Is it the person who is kind of a part of a technical team uh, or is it really a person with a media conservation background, do you know? And he's from the conservator uh, department, or what is this? <laughs> I don't know what. Uh, not uh, technical, not, not, not from the technical stuff. But uh, like uh, the intermedia, things <laughs> can overlap each other. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, yeah. I, I think we can, uh, if, if there are no more comments or questions, uh, we can come back to these and exp expand more uh, at the at the at the end of the of today's uh, seminar with kind of a group conversation. So maybe it's time to move on to uh, uh, to another presentation. Thank you so much, Attila. Thank you also, Attila, uh, if you can stop sharing the screen. It's on the lower bar again. Good, thank you. Uh, so the next one should be Michal Bialicki, uh, who I welcome here. Uh, Michal Bialicki was born in 1954. He emigrated from Czechoslovakia to Germany in 1969. After working as a photographer in the USA, he studied at Kunstakademie Düsseldorf uh, from, from 87 as a student of Namjoon Pike in his master class. Home, he then served as an assistant until 1989. In 1988, he received a study grant for the Cité Internationale des Arts de Paris. Uh, in 1991, he became one of the founding teaching staff in the Department of New Media at the Academy, Academy Vytvarných Umění in Prague. Uh, Bielski lives uh, and works in, in Prague and Düsseldorf. Um, so, <laughs> okay, maybe 
we'll get more updated information now. <laughs> but uh, please, Michael, uh, if you can turn on your mic. Yep. Okay. Uh, Jakub, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a hot topic. It's an eternal topic. Uh, I live indeed, uh, meanwhile, in Karlsruhe, uh, mainly uh, where I have a professorship at the same building like the ZKM, the Center for Art and Technology. So I'm the lucky one who won in the lottery being in this uh, place where uh, you have a school and museum uh, together and the research departments. And uh, I even don't have to leave the building and I can spend whole life here. So. Uh, first of all, I would like just briefly comment on, on Attila's presentation. I was highly impressed of your work and uh, it's very close to me, uh, this mentally and intellectually, all this, your alchemistic and, and uh, research. And uh, I guess you are also uh, corrected with, with, um, um, with uh, Mr. Paternak, uh, with, with Miklos, right? Uh, uh, and uh, I guess uh, this is one. Uh, there is a lot of. This is one. Uh, there is a lot. I hear now myself, but it's okay. Can you hear me? By the way, You're, yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, just a brief uh, remark that I, I like very much your work, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting, especially in the age of AI and uh, you know. Uh, uh, data driven and what stuff you you are you have this position which I think it's uh, it's a really really a, an, an important one and even for the young generations but um, how should I uh, start uh, maybe I would like to use a metaphor uh, you know when we are young uh, we um, generally uh, think we are immortal right we think we live forever right and like this, it is also with the with the media art. When you start to work in this, at least in my case, it was the case when you when I did video art in the 80s, um, uh, where I was lucky to be uh, with Namjoon Pike uh, close to him, and I never thought maybe there should be some difficulties in 10, 20, 30, 40. I would never imagine you. It's like when you are young, you don't die. But I tell you one thing, any media art, it doesn't matter how much you preserve and fight against, against the death of media art, it will die. But it doesn't mean we should not do it. And of course, this is a battle and it's, uh, it's uh, almost a, a romantic idea, but it's the same romantic idea that we we live and we stay even though we will disappear one day. So it's the same, exactly the same case with media art. And media art is such a wide, uh, wide uh, spectrum. What What is it? It's a, such a fuzzy term, media art or new. It's everything and nothing. We know it's about light and motion and software and, and whatever. It's everything which is often time-based, right, but also also technological on hardware, software. So it's like very fuzzy term, which is good. Uh, ho hopefully it remains fuzzy and uh, hopefully it will never be an, the definition of media art. But what I'm trying to say that what I understand the position of the museums, which look for possibility to integrate media art in the collection and show it's all nice, but it will never help to employ one technical person. It's naive because they are often custom made the thing. And this person has not the capacity and the expertise to, to take care of each that you need often. It's so complex. Uh, so so uh, definitely the museum, if they want prolong the life, uh, of the of the bought pieces, they should have a network of external, external, um, let's say experts. But even generally, even this will not help. I can see here in that time there is a uh, big uh, issue: the restoration. And I can see how they deal with it. And maybe I will run one example of my work. I will not. I hope I can succeed. I don't know how you how I do it. I know I have to click first. I I run the 
Wait a minute. Uh, I, I I guess I can I share with you. Yes, there is I the, just on the lower share, bar. right? Open Next. share stay. Yeah. I never use this software, so uh, so I do it, and now you choose the window you want to share. Uh, well, it says Microsoft would like to record this computer screen. Deny. That might be the thing. Yes. <laughs> so so I say open uh, no, open system preferences. My God. Okay, my God. Now you see that it starts. I'm sorry to bother, but I would like to show you. So uh, I guess I have to uh, Microsoft. Is it Microsoft? How it's called? Microsoft Teams. Teams. Okay, I click. Maybe. Okay. Maybe Michael, uh, yes. you can you can send me uh, the presentation or, or or the link via email, and I can show it if there is problem. So I think we'll wait for a moment until Michal is back. But luckily if he's frozen on a relatively good still, you know, that's good photo actually. <laughs> And I see we have the same hair styler. <laughs> True. Um, so maybe there's now uh, space for uh, for uh, discussion. So if there is any notes or comments, I think we should really kind of uh, maybe call call him to restart the teams. Do we have okay. any contact I, on? Michael? I think he did it, but. Uh, Oh, oh yeah. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. You see, it was a perfect demonstration how it should not work. So don't buy anything. Don't buy buy paintings and sculptures and forget about it, man. You know. What, okay. Uh, I I think I now I try one more. If it doesn't work, I promise I leave it. Okay, because I know you are not a experimental. Uh, a laboratory here, but uh, okay. I try one more. Uh, okay. Oh, this looks promising! Wow. Yes, we can see it. You yeah, see, it works. Okay, now I run it, and you can hear me, right? Yes. Does it move? It does. Uh, does it move? It does, yes. Okay, okay. So I will be just very uh, uh, brief because I may, I have to go too low to the with the with the volume of the piece. Otherwise, I cannot um, hear myself, uh, and I cannot hear you, especially. So what you see, it's a work which um, I did with my partner, with my wife, uh, Camilla B. Richter for many, many years developing. So this is just one state of evolution, more than 10 years, lots of um, software power, lots of different programmers, but lots of money in it. It's based on Flash, and it's very unusual way how you could use Flash. Maybe some of you are old enough to know what is Flash, because maybe the youngest generation even don't know what is Flash, you know? So as we know, Flash is dead. So you see, we invest lots of time, lots of money, and this work is not uh, possible to show on any device, including mobiles, including um, other devices. You can you take an old machine and uh, uh, show it uh, and on some old machine with an old operating system. This is just briefly to the work. It's called Garden. Oh, it, it, it finished probably. Okay, I go one more. It's uh, it's a data-driven piece where you have uh, all kind of um, animated scenes from our universe. We are surrounded, and behind is a kind of Japanese garden in Tokyo recorded. And it's connected to data, and you have a Twitter Twitter uh, information. Um, this part is less uh, less 
interactive. We have another one where you can use it as a kind of pseudo game where you have the illusion you can do something, but at the end it's the New York Stock Exchange which decide for you what happens there. So uh, we call all those works data-driven narratives where we use real-time data uh, uh, which interfere with the content. I will go out here now. I hope I will be successful. Uh, maybe I just close the window and come back to my, okay. Uh, so what I'm trying to say, it's so frustrating. You work 10 years and then you have something and you have to rebuild it, right? You have to re, if you want, and there are many ways and it, you need another cache and you need manpower and time. And we have big database of those animation. Those remain, of course, so there is at least something. But to put this project together will be not exactly the same because it will be based on another technology. So there are so many issues about this around this kind of works of pre uh, present uh, pre uh, pre pre preservation. Sorry. So I can see it in ZKM in. Uh, uh, there are there is this amazing collection of masters of history or whatever and half of the works they have to restore and they did it even with completely new software they hired programmers because the artists are dead or their artists have no interest or no time whatever so they made the new versions so what is the original is it an issue in this case it's original or not the same with archive i did a retrospective in that came about two years two and a half years ago and we worked with my archive which is about three terabytes of many variations of the project and <clears throat> it's so difficult to define at the end what is the real work does it work do we have to apply this term of of original you know so if we think about um about uh, Walter Benjamin's famous, uh, uh, you know, book, uh, art uh, work in the age of uh, technological reproduction. So maybe we should we should uh, not be so dogmatic and not so orthodox uh, to 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 um, insist that this is original, this is not. Every Namjoon Pike work is today restored. Every everything is restored and it will die anyway so it's anyway we know it will die so come on don't don't think that you have now fantastic infrastructure so if you are successful you will be 20 years successful maybe 30 but then sometimes it will be piece of metal it will be piece box of a tv or box of you you will exhibit at the end maybe it's like reliquian in german you say you will exhibit the piece of computer as a you know rest of the work and you will never see again it's moving but there will be maybe documentation beside these pieces of metal and pieces of and then there will be this origin this video which will show how it used to be. I guess this is the destiny of preservation of media art and everything else is a very, uh, very, let's say, um, uh, romantic, wishful thinking. And uh, also how you, um, I have, I, I'm lucky I have an assistant who works on my archive and all the, on the retrospective and he's also signed, uh, how you say, uh, um, Kunstwissenschaftler in German, you say. Uh, he, he's scientist, theoretician, and he, also how you approached all those things in a reflection. It's very different than a fixed piece, a piece of painting, piece of sculpture. It's a living thing. It's a living in uh, many directions, and it's our our longing for original and for for something. Uh, it's basically instable media. We, it should not be called new media, but instable media. It's much more pr precise and much more honest, right? Uh, and uh, we should accept that this kind of art is something which is in permanent progress or process or dying, whatever you, uh, however you define it. It is an, it is an, we should accept this quality. 
So the museum as a place which long to preserve should leave this, uh, this idea that we, you know, like I, I, I had to laugh that in Hamburg it's illegal to let the artist to touch his own work or her own work because it's, 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 I, it's I'm sorry, it's stupid. It's just self-suicidal, but they should suicide, why not? So, uh, uh, yes, and it's still worse to fight for it, it's worse to do it, to create, it's all worth it, and it's worse to try to preserve, but be aware that there are, we, we will all die and the media art as well. So I think that's enough for now. And uh, thank you uh, for your attention and uh, yes. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for this, uh, I would call it an intervention uh, in the discussion. Maybe, well, it's just the first uh, first thing on my mind is, uh, uh, <clears throat> Michael, if you have, uh, <clears throat> How your experience differs between, let's say, private collectors and the uh, public museums? Do 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 you see difference in terms of uh, kind of this uh, drive to to re to keep this original alive, uh, or uh, or like do you see any difference in terms of preservation in a kind of market and uh, uh, public collections? Well, as we know, the market makes it's avoiding generally to uh, get involved with media there are a few exceptions they collect uh, video art there is a great video art private video art collection stoshek it's pretty famous from dusseldorf she sits in dusseldorf and and and, and in uh, berlin of course she has a relatively easy life because it's video and you can pretty well uh, you know, store video in a uh, hard disk in many ways. So it's a relatively a stable format. But anything else, what is, um, uh, where is some kind of code or an object, video art object, let's say video installation, video sculpture, however you call it, um, it has a limited life. You will one day have to replace it. I'm now buying in, in, eBay's, um, uh, I'm doing what Namjoon Pike did uh, 30 years ago, but I'm doing it now with objects from 80s. They are beautiful Sony monitors, metal, professional from studios. And I use them for, recently I did some uh, show in Prague and I collected some of those beautiful pieces, but also there are those still uh, tubes. It's not flat, it's not L LED or LCD or however you call it, but it's a glass tube. They have fantastic quality, but they are all used, so they will die. They will die, and I could sell it to some collector, and it's beautiful as an object. It works because the the content corresponds with the time when those TV monitors were made, and I even edited in that time, in the middle of 80s, those exactly on this. So, so I feel very familiar. It belongs together. But okay, now somebody buy it, and what is in 20, 30 years? I can buy, and this I do sometimes, spare, that they can replace. I did it now for Prague, I have an installation which is 30 years. Now. So I bought on software, I found another set of five. But I'm just prolonging, I'm just prolonging the life. That's all. So I would, to, to go, come back to your, uh, I would say there are some private collectors. There are more carriages than the museums. The museums are scared because they think it's a, it is a money from the taxes. So we have to be responsible. But so we have to buy something which remains, which is very stupid. Sorry to say it. No, I don't say stupid. Uh, uh, it's not so smart. Yeah, thank you for this. Uh, uh, is there anyone uh, with a question or comment? Yeah. Oh, uh, go ahead, Pavel. Oh, okay. I switched my mic on. Um, I was thinking about this case with Flash, which uh, it hurted me also, really. <laughs> I, I have some uh, works uh, coded in, uh, actually not in Flash, but in Action Script, in Flex, uh, basically, and that's the same issue. But I'm thinking about the case. 
you know it's uh, because if we uh, if we treat the source code like uh, uh, like a score let's say like the musical notes it is uh, actually for, for musical piece for example the score is the original so actually in, from this point of view the original is still uh, exists the only problem is that we cannot play the original yes that's exactly the case you could preserve the code but then what you do there is no compatibility with the modern hardware or the system has so often this i have some works i have lots of custom made stuff and often just the system changed some little in i don't know in something little and it doesn't work it's so frustrating it's so and of course the software is not made for people like us. It's not made for artists. It's made for consumers, plug and play, and uh, they don't care, you know. So we are like outsiders, and nobody will have a uh, mercy with us in any sense. Uh, so uh, the only way, uh, you know, it's not. A, it looks like it's a pessimistic uh, statement from me. It's just, and I had to find out, I, I didn't thought like, this, I didn't think like this, maybe still even five or 10 years ago, I was much more, let's say, optimistic. But it's not pessimistic, it's just to accept the mortality or the limited life of whatever we call uh, media. And then it's fine, when we adapt it, it's fine, and maybe it's good, and maybe it's, you know, there is even art from, there are paintings which change. Even Joseph Boyce's fat uh, is falling apart. So why should be so, um, you know, fighting for the... Of course, it's nice. I wish also my work would be visible. But I guess it's part of it. And it's an analogy to our own life. So it will definitely not uh, survive uh, something like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, this prehistoric, prehistoric objects which are 20, 30, 40,000 years old, no way. It's maybe 40 months, maybe 40, maybe uh, 100 months, maybe 200, but it will, it, and I think it would be fair also to, uh, uh, for the museums and for the staff to, to, to kind of accept, to, to, to acknowledge this and somehow to accept this and it, and, and, to not see it as a necessarily as a as a as a negative something negative because you serve the public and as long you keep it alive you serve you you know it's it's uh, in zoo the 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 lion will also die you know <laughs> yeah yeah um i think the yeah this is very uh, hard from let's say uh, to imagine from uh, let's say this museological perspective since uh, as as uh, soon as something enters the collection you are responsible for its uh, let's say survival so in, in case like and since if you're not able to <clears throat> provide this survival you better not uh, not collect it so it's it's almost like a case against uh, collecting these kind of works but uh, there is also uh, very different approaches to uh, media conservation, media restoration. And I think ZKM is well known for their, uh, let, I would, well, maybe let's, let's call it media archaeological approach to really <clears throat> trying to preserve these uh, original hardware, original software, whatever it takes. Uh, <clears throat> we can also see it in, um, in a collection of contemporary art museum in Zagreb, uh, where uh, there, there are these beautiful pieces from new tendencies from uh, 60s, 70s, and uh, they spent a great deal of time really like finding the screws from 1971, which was which were used in like this or, this or that installation, and uh, really tried to uh, preserve it in this very very original state. <clears throat> but there are also approaches that. Um, uh, kind of uh, uh, embrace this uh, iterativity of the work. So, I mean, when we look at the different media installations, they usually like uh, they're usually shown in a kind of a different uh, 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 different sta state, a different uh, version. Let's say they they also change during their active active life uh, before they're collected by museum or uh, this or that place. 
So, <clears throat> so the job of this uh, museum is to really, uh, of course, I mean, uh, uh, preserve the like the hardware and software side, but also to understand the 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 kind of artistic vision behind it. So interview artists, uh, understand what is important from conceptual, uh, what is important from co uh, aesthetic uh, perspective. And then uh, as uh, really as uh, Pavel really, uh, this is at, at the core maybe at, of the contemporary art conservation to see these changing works as, as something like a kind of, uh, to, to find a score. And the score, of course, uh, if there is a software, software is part of, part of the score. But uh, another part of the score are are uh, artist instructions for in installation, and uh, it's yeah, it's kind of uh, more complex. But but the but the comparison, I would say, to let's say theater or music uh, composition is uh, really at at place. Uh, so yeah, I would I would say it's really based on the, on the on the approach of of uh, every. Uh, kind of collecting institution, and uh, yeah, it's it's we're I think we're really still at the kind of early days, uh, kind of of this of this uh, little field, and uh, I hope that uh, the more institutions start collecting these kind of works, the more uh, we will uh, kind of learn how to sustain them. Yeah, Go ahead. very briefly because I know next guests. Uh, are speaking you know uh, it's not true especially here in Setkaim and I see it when they restore works they uh, as well as hardware as well as software when it helps at the end it's about the concept we should not be also so orthodox if the of course this it's software based it's hardware based but if the piece the restored piece is often so different so different even the code has to be made different that it shows what it should show. So at the end, it's also, we should more think about the recipient than the, uh, you know, pray to the original. And if it communicates what the what was the aim of the artist to the recipient, it's fine. And it's allowed to do also to apply, uh, let's say, uh, alternative uh, solutions and methods. And they do it here. They do it here, so they are not so. The the code is holy. Of course, they try, and but sometimes, just to experience what the artist, what was the aim, what of the artist, it's the priority before the. If you get my point, so it's not like for any price we preserve, preserve. Okay, I will shut up. No, thanks. Thank you so much. I think this was really, uh, yeah, really coming to the core of the of these kind of questions of of our project. And uh, yeah, this is what we'll be discussing over several months. And uh, this is really great that we are able to uh, dive deeper today. Uh, maybe Jakub, shall we uh, move to another presentation, and then we will also have this general discussion at the end. Thank you so much again, Mikhail. Thank you, Michal. Uh, there was a very important, important statement and uh, presentation. Thanks. So now I would like to excuse Jana Bernartová once again, who is in store or who is opening her exhibition in Strasbourg. And uh, now we officially know that she's not participating today. Um, but she sent us uh, two of her videos that she left without a comment and said that um, uh, the one is actually, uh, since it is a sort of a lecture, uh, that it's uh, her own like artistic comment to the to the topic. So so we'll see, and then then we can even discuss without without Jana. Uh, maybe the the statement that's that's presented in the in the video. But first of all, let me introduce her, although she's not here. Jana Bernartová, born in 1983. Uh, she has graduated at the Faculty of Arts and Architecture at the Technical University of Liberec, where she studied in the studio of visual communication, digital media at Stanislav Zipper studio. Uh, during those years, she also studied at the, digital, uh, at the Atelier of Photography and Intermedia, led by Lubos Tach at the Academy of Fine Arts in Bratislava. 
and in the studio of Intermedia led by Václav Stratil, the Faculty of, uh, of Fine Arts in Brno. She successfully completed the doctoral program at the Supermedia Studio of Federico Diaz at the Academy of Fine Arts, Architecture and Design in Prague. Uh, she currently lives and works in Prague and Liberec. In her work, she examines uh, the relationships between the virtuality of digital space and its material intersection into the world in question. She monitors the principles and possibilities of presetting and standardization and their possible failures. Through her visually measured intermediate works, she comments on the state of the contemporary world of art. So uh, after this short introduction, let me uh, show these two videos, I hope uh, the sound, which is very important here, uh, will be uh, will be hearable. Can you hear something? No sound from the video. Okay, so I will have to uh, do it through my uh, speakers. And can you see the video? Now there is a blank uh, screen with cursor. Now I see video. Okay. And the, there was a sound, yeah. Spectacle modrého světla. Tato věta nemá konec. Někdy si myslím, že nemá začátek. Stvořili jste divokou, vzácnou, hroznou, chutnou, milou, tragickou, vulgární, hrůzostrašnou, božskou věc. Douglas Davis. 2000. Modré světlo zářících monitorů zaplavilo svět. Obklopuje vše, co se odstne v jeho dosahu. Svět se topí v modrém světle. Spektakulární potopa světla modré. Odkud začít? Kdy je ten správný čas vstoupit do pavučiny zdrojů všudy přítomného světla? Teď? 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 Zen na každý den. Je život ve věčné přítomnosti modrý jako dory? Rybí kamarádka nemá ztracená v teď? 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 Guy Debor popsal pavučinu modře zářících displejů jako integrovaný spektákl, v němž vládne věčná přítomnost. Modře vyzařující teď. Permanentně osvětlená scéna, na níž jsou všechny události vystavené najednou. Teď. Pod zámínkou nikdy nekončící inovace pavučina modrých světel expanduje všemi směry. Ztrácí se našemu pohledu příliš gigantická a příliš miniaturní zároveň. Je pro nás neviditelná, nepochopitelná, všeprostupující, všudy přítomná, božská. Ať je technika, viva technologia. Síť obklopující celý svět, World Wide Web, se nám zjevuje v podobě modře zářících obrazovek všech možných velikostí. Stolní počítač, notebook, tablet, chytrý telefon i hodinky. Tato souhvězdí nás udržují v permanentní nepozornosti. Mezi tím, ve stínu temném přímo úměrné zářivé záři obrazovek, se odehrávají procesy podléhající režimu všeobecného utajení. Permanentně aktualizovaný status quo post digitální revoluce. Evil media. Možná zní ale otázka jinak. Jak se vymanit z této pavučiny? Kde se nachází místo, odkud lze nahlédnout modré světlo? Nekonečné, všeobjímající teď. Povýšená iluze majitelů kritického rozumu že existuje místo vně pavučiny zdrojů modrého světla, z něhož lze pořídit objektivní záznamy o pozorování zkoumaného jevu, byla spochybněna. Pokud neexistuje nic mimo integrovaný spektákl modrého světla, je třeba opustit imaginární sedačku na tribuně, sestoupit do arény a v souboji tváří v tvář, využít všechny vědomosti, zkušenosti a instinkty k tomu, aby se projevil charakter soupeře, jeho silné a slabé stránky, jeho deklarované schopnosti i tajné zbraně. 
Matthew Full navrhuje, aby v tomto zápase byla využita strategie remediace, překlad z jednoho média do druhého a zkoumaný systém má být provokován k sebereflexi, interrogability. Experiment číslo jedna. Následují jeho instrukce. Vystavují se modrému světlu vyzařujícímu z monitoru počítače a hledám v překladu význam modrého světla. Výzkumná metoda, překlad z jednoho jazykového systému do druhého. Nástroje. Google překladač. Překlad do všech nabízených jazyků v abecedním pořadí defaultně nabízeném touto aplikací. Translator. Simultánní překlad do všech jazyků nabízených aplikací. Výstupy. Závěry. Automatizovaný překlad vytvořil laboratorní podmínky. Izolovaný jev byl sterilně překládán z jednoho jazyka do druhého. V pevně utažené smyčce vzájemného zrcadlení slov v metamorfózách formy se význam modrého světla zakuklil jako larva modrého motýla. Mezihra. Namaluj mi modré světlo, prosím. Experiment číslo dvě. Znovu usedám k počítači v naději, že její přinutím k doznání. Vpisuji otázky do okénka vyhledavače a zapisuji, co vypovídá tento modře zářící přístroj o modře zářících přístrojích. Výzkumná metoda, tázání se systému, co je tento systém s cílem vyvolat sebereflexy systému. Nástroje, Google vyhledávač. Postup, zadávám slovní spojení Blue Light a Blue Light Devices. Postupně procházím odpovědi v nabízených kategoriích. Vše, obrázky, zprávy, videa, knihy. Proplétám se záplavou slov ilustrovaných fotografiemi s modrým filtrem. Lavina opakujících se informací jako ochranný štít. Efektivní strategie odklánění mé pozornosti. Závěry. Modré světlo vyzařující zařízení způsobují. Nespavost. Zrušení cyklického prožívání dne způsobené modrým světlem imitujícím věčné ráno. Nespavost není jiné označení pro bdělost. Je jejím opakem. Znamená ustrnutí v čase. Někde mezi spánkem a bděním. Příznaky podobné intoxikaci. Strnulý pohled. Středobodem pozornosti se stává modře zářící obrazovka. Vše kolem se ocitá ve stínu naší pozornosti. Hypnotický stav. Fascinace. Oči jako rozhraní, kterým proniká modré světlo rovnou k naší mysli. Z každého druhého článku se vyklube reklamní sdělení. Podobní obchodníci nabízejí nevyspalým operátorům, cidícím na modře zářící displeje, zaručeně účinné ochranné brýle. Jejich skla jsou na rozdíl od slunečních brýlí čirá nebo žlutá, jako ta, která umožňují vidět lépe v mlze. Fake news, dokonalý trik. Modré světlo jako hybrid. Přidává modré světlo na seznam hybridů, které stvořila moderní společnost a věda. Skládám jeho podobu jako patchwork. Z exaktních popisů fyziků, ze statistických dat sociologů, z ambivalentních článků očních lékařů a psychologů, z poplašných zpráv, senzace chtivých popularizátorů vědy a prodavačů brýlí. Nebe na zemi. Souhvězdí modrých světel září do noci i dne. Komorní hudba podle Viléma Flusera? Ne. Je to planetární světelná show. Rozsvícené monitory tvoří souhvězdí modrých světel. 
hvězdná obloha, která nikdy nezapadá ani nevychází. Stvořili jsme dílo, které se nedá vystavit v galerii a nemá publikum, ale působí na každého, kdo se zapojí. Umělé stvoření, které se vymklo z řádu lidských výtvorů, je neviditelné lidskému pohledu. Čistý proud signálu, který proniká skrze sítnici oka přímo do hlavy. Přesně tak, jak to předpovídal Willem Flusser ve své bajce o umění budoucnosti, které se zbaví závislosti na hmotě jako médiu a smyslech jako satelitech estetického zážitku a bude čistou informací schopnou transformovat mysl recipienta. Mind fuck. Tato věta nemá konec. Někdy si myslím, že nemá začátek. Stvořili jste divokou, vzácnou, hroznou, chutnou, milou, tragickou, vulgární, hrůzostrašnou, božskou věc. Douglas Davis, 2000. Okay, now there's one more short video that uh, Jana said is now uh, a part of the exhibition in Strasbourg. It's called I want to see liquid crystals. Okay, now it got frozen. So, but I think you uh, get the general idea. It's just the excerpt of the longer video. Uh, so I'll stop sharing. Yes. Um, so s since Jana is not here, uh, we won't get any commentary from her. Uh, maybe just a short commentary from me. Uh, I think Anna was also supposed to um, represent here a more um, not 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 really, but but uh, this sort of uh, generation closer to the digital-born artists, uh, which is I think uh, um, now a big issue with with the generation of of artists uh, growing to the to their to the finish of their schools and and starting their careers uh, artists who were actually digital born so so uh, growing up with computers and so on and so on uh, so I think the approach is also different uh, but I, I don't want to I don't want to um, represent or interpret Jana here at all but uh, maybe uh, we can also discuss this 
uh, if there is if you have any comments on on this topic of generations of new media artists and so on please michael well uh, actually uh, uh, it's impressive that this young generation, those digital natives, we call them, uh, actually use an, an, an statement from Douglas Davis from 2000, which is more than 20 years ago. So this is interesting that she is aware of an issue which we are surrounded, which generally actually the, the, the digital natives are not so much aware, they just dive in and it becomes part of the, uh, uh, the Peter Weibel uh, call it uh, infosphere, right? We have uh, we have atmosphere around the earth. Now we have an infosphere. So they, they dive in this infosphere. Uh, they are born in it and they don't question. She, even she's the younger generation, she does. This is for me pretty um, impressive that there is this awareness have a look, even if it's relatively um, only 25 years old um, um, issue, starting with World Wide Web uh, and the in human interconnection and the, the, the uh, extension of human brain into collective brain we call, uh, we call net, web, internet, however. So th 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 this impressed me that she used this as a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, I am even I'm new generation. I'm aware of of the let's say paradoxum of this. On on one side, amazing amazing uh, achievement for humanity regarding knowledge communication and so on, and uh, in the same time a kind of threat, right? So this this kind of uh, yes that she it's a statement she did a statement using uh, which is more than 21 years old and this is imp I'm pretty impressed to see this it's a very subjective um, now my my uh, uh, how should I say uh, uh, sub it's I'm almost surprised because uh, generally the, na uh, the the digital natives just go and use it and live in it and i they don't question even for example often uh, of course because they are young the 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 the, the limitation of life of uh, media artwork and last but not least and uh, that uh, you know artists generally always did art to 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 somehow fulfill the transcendental needs, which is really archaic, uh, you know, the, the, the Egyptian built pyramids and every 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 culture, every everybody try to prolong its existence into an artist do it generally or did it and do it still also consciously, subconsciously with uh, with uh, art. But in media art, it doesn't work. You know, so it's more analogy to to. I'm always insisting on the same. You know, it's not my topic. I even I hate it to say it because it's also touching me. And I say, fuck, I did the wrong. I used the wrong medium. I should have used a stone or whatever. Like this, at the end of the day, nobody will know anything about me. I will be dead and rotten, and my media art will be also dead and rotten. And uh, it's in a way totally paradoxical behavior. To, to, to make a media art if you want to prolong your existence into eternity. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't want to reinterpret Jana because, uh, because she's definitely not like uh, the young generation or like the youngest generation, the digital native, as you say. Uh, and, but uh, anyway, I think that, uh, or What's your impression on it? I think that there is a, a big interest in the work of Willem Flusser in nowadays art, and and uh, I think like many young young artists even are are uh, revisiting this his uh, theories and and base their their art uh, on it because I think it's it's more. Uh, urgent than ever before, you know, because they they also reflect the, the the times we're living in. Yeah. 
Um, is there any other comment on on Jana's work? And so maybe we can proceed to to Pavel Janicki, uh, to our last speaker. Uh, Pavel Janicki was born in 1974. He's an independent media artist and producer working with generative music, microsound and algorithmic composition interactive systems for performances and installations and his own hard and software. His work draws mainly on the achievements of music, contemporary and media art and post-humanist practice, but he constructs forms different from the existing ones. Uh, he engages a wide spectrum of techniques, approaches and protocols, creates works using synthetic senses, uh, programming techniques, also in the modern cognitive incarnation, and elements of space and material engineering. An important role in Yanisky's creativity is drawn from historical and current contexts. In particular, he perceived the history of art and something that could be called the history of thinking. He cooperates with Bro Art uh, Center, where he leads the Bro Laboratory. And uh, currently he's also co-curating the Vroart Biennale in Wroclaw. Pavel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm very happy to be here because it's a really interesting discussion and all, all the previous uh, presentations was really, really inspiring. And uh, when Barbara invited me to uh, the panel, she sent me a question. What does it mean for artists to aspire with their work to be included in their collections? Uh, so uh, I think uh, that relation between collections, collecting, collectors, artworks, artists is complex and ambiguous. I have some remarks on this subject, but not a polished and coherent system of views. So, for example, currently being collected is considered desirable as an indicator of a successful career. But of course, if we remember that uh, the early years of performance or conceptual art, it was believed that the non-collectability of performances or uh, conceptual artworks was an important and positive factor. So, uh, <clears throat> another problem for me is I'm also uh, especially as uh, uh, a specialist rather in a uh, unique cases, not entire categories of things. So uh, probably I will provide some special cases uh, for you. And uh, I would also like to avoid this very typical situation when artists uh, simply, uh, let's say, advertises his or her works. So I will tell you a bit about my experiences related to art, but not always to making art. But uh, however, there will be also uh, some things about my own works. Uh, and about Barbara's question, mm, transferring works to collections often generates income, cash flow. So it is a useful uh, thing for the artist. It helps to survive. Uh, it also actually helps in building, you know, your professional position, even without the cash flow, as we know. So, uh, from the other hand, and maybe this is more important for artists related to so-called new media, it is also important that if someone else takes care of uh, the conservation and keeping their work in the collection, it removes many problems from the artist. But of course, as we discussed before, both cases are quite problematic because the art market is very specific on field of the media art and also this conservation process is not always really successful. Uh, and so now I would like to show you some examples to illustrate my various experiences and tough on that field, but also I maybe I will send you over our chat a set of links so you can uh, copy and paste those links if you want to. 
you don't need to make a notes from the presentation. It's very, you know, <laughs> handy situation. And also, I will be sharing my screen with a simple presentation with um, hope uh, you can see it now. Um, with uh, steels, but if you want um, more information about the um, topics I will be discussing, also videos from the works, documentations, you can use the link, so it's probably easier. Okay, so uh, um, five years ago, in 2016, three works by Ken Feingold, the pioneer of robotic and AI-oriented art, were presented in Poland. It was uh, inferior, <coughs> inferior, sorry, uh, the animal, vegetables, minerals, and everything, uh, and uh, hell. And uh, all of them are uh, media art classics discussed in many publications. All three of these works were uh, accidentally destroyed. A jewelry, a logistic company, an author, people managing the collections, in which the works are located, all of them started a court battle over who and how much uh, should pay to the author for the renovation of the work. Uh, and what was also very interesting, only the author is able to do that, only the author is able to recreate the works, which I think is actually another stone for our garden. And the, the calculations were very divergent. The author's valuation was about $100,000. The uh, logistic company proposed $6,000. So the, the company didn't include any artistic value or non-industrial, not ready-made elements, like a custom-made sculpture, for example, in uh, details only hardware and they declared as most of the equipment is outdated. Let's say computers from 90s was weaker than contemporary computer. They uh, can cover cost of second-hand equipment, which is of course very cheap now. So for example, silicon graphics computer, which was extremely heavy uh, uh, in terms of cost, extremely costly. Uh, now you can buy in very cheap, uh, uh, as a very cheap outdated equipment on eBay or, or some, some, somewhere. So uh, the jewelry ordered me uh, an uh, expert opinion, evaluation of the renovation costs, because they decided that by practicing quite similar on quite similar field of art and having many years of document. Experience. I'm a person with the same field of expertise, basically. So, uh, just think. So, we have an exhib exhibition institution with all the infrastructure, but yet it has never been able to secure the work, nor calculate the renovation costs. Uh, another uh, uh, artist is hired as expert, which is probably a very good idea. And the author is forced to do, uh, to do to make the reconstruction by himself. So uh, where is the power of the institutional level? I really don't know. By the way, my own estimation was really uh, near to the author's. So my was 95 thousands of dollars, let's say 5 thousands less to the original. And the... And the other work I want to uh, uh, introduce you, uh, it's, uh, it's called Post Apocalypse. Uh, it was a Polish pavilion on Prague Quadriennial six years ago. Uh, the work won a gold medal even. Uh, I was one of the authors of the pavilion. Uh, after the works returned to Poland, it uh, turned out that no institution with uh, which the pavilion team had contact is able to include it in their collection or store it because it was too expensive. So uh, the, uh, maybe I should say about a few words about the work. So that was, as you can see, physical sculptural forms vibrating and in the way that bone conducting sounds was uh, produced. So if you touch this uh, 
if you touch this uh, parts of the um, sculpture, you can hear uh, Polish romantic poetry. We selected we selected uh, poetry related to nature because it was actually about the um, end of the nature situation. So the Polish Minister of Culture, and you know, it was a shortly after a shift in Polish politics when alt-right wings uh, was uh, win the election process. Polish Minister of Culture suggests that we uh, should close the work in an unsecured warehouse in order to ensure its legal destruction and to be able to say, you know, scrap it. So. It was something like anti-collection because we was just waiting for the end of the um, for the end of uh, the, the work is will be still uh, in good shape. Uh, so we decided to uh, destroy the work ourselves, took it to the scrapyard uh, of old cars and pressed it. And uh, this is the effect. The object we are uh, even sometimes showing uh, from time to time. And in short, it seems to me that for this particular um, uh, for this particular war, its destruction created a better closure and a deeper situation than make, making it a part of the collection. And uh, this is uh, entire uh, another work, uh, this time my own. It's, it is very simply work called Vinyl Video Delay. All of the works uh, I'm showing you are, you know, linked in the um, note I send you to chat so you can switch to the video if you want to. And in this work, you can basically scratch with your own real time image. Um, uh, so, uh, t using turntable technique, very simple work with very strange effect because it's like, you know, abduction of your own body. So, uh, actually, two copies of this work are in the collections. One I sold to a private collection uh, and the other one to a public. Both uh, were quite prestigious in Poland, but unfortunately, the owner of the private collection was sent to prison for tax fraud. So I don't know if it is uh, still adds prestige to me, or maybe even more prestige. I don't know. Uh, and the private collection is richer, uh, so the public uh, collection has better intellectual capital. So to reduce costs, the public collection bought the work without some technical components, for example, without the screen. So uh, of course, so far it is easy to get this type of screen, it's just a monitor, but probably at some point it will be uh, more problematic. Uh, so we have a relatively safe version of the work in the private collection, but of course this private uh, is problematic the fate of which is highly uncertain, and a version that requires more work uh, if the public uh, is also in some way incomplete. And uh, and another uh, another slide. It um, you know I think it seems to me that it is also worth paying attention to such forms of maintaining that are not traditional collections, but are important for digital art. Not, uh, not NFT tags, which are separate topic at all. And uh, this particular project, Max and P5JS, is uh, one of my, let's say, pet projects. Um, it uh, is even not an artwork per se, uh, in traditional meaning. Uh, technically, it is a communication protocol to integrate to uh, typically used by media artists programming environments, Max MSP and P5JS. So it is a kind of the concept that other creators can use in their own works. It is uh, very simple to collect this because it is just a piece of software in some text files, but 
This particular design makes sense as long as it is applied in other works by other creators. So taking it out of the context of functioning within other works is debatable. Uh, but from the other hand, the presence uh, in the open source circulation makes it both accessible and alive. Actually, entire culture is based on continuation, right? And oh, I think I'm very quick this uh, this time. And the last uh, case I want to introduce, uh, it is uh, a work called the Concerto for TV Set and the Diode for Wojtek. And it's a work made by uh, Vro Art Center team. So actually, many people work on that. And um, this is a work created over two concepts by Wojciech Bruszewski, a Polish artist, filmmaker, photographer. And it is, uh, it is not a tribute, it is not a reproduction of existing work, even if it is using one video work by Bruszewski uh, called yeah, long scream, actually. And it also uh, uses an uh, idea from another work by Bruszewski, TV Chicken, uh, uh, which is uh, which is very simple. You can see you have TV screen with a light sensor attached to it, and uh, when the lightness of the uh, image is changing, it's producing sound. And very simply way, it is the sensor is just attached to the loudspeaker, so there is no special, uh, no not digital, but even not uh, amplification be between the loudspeaker and the sensor. Very very basic idea. So uh, as the concept, uh, I think you you know this this is maybe some kind of the concept related to the the, the base preservation topic we are discussing because uh, uh, actually. We don't need original work if we can understand, uh, maybe not, even not the score we, we also discussed before, but just the, um, some base idea of the work. And again, if entire culture is built over continuation, maybe this is the, the best way we can, uh, we can imagine. Um, okay, so that's it. I will be trying to switch off the screen sharing, which is quite problematic for me because this may be frozen. I don't know. <laughs> oh, OK. I think I'm back. And uh, OK. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. So uh, I think what I showed you, it's quite resonating with the previous uh, presentation. So it's maybe it's a good coincidence that uh, I'm the last uh, one because probably we are made some kind of collective presentation, which is, I think, very interesting situation because that was not scored before thank you guys thank you very much of course if you have any question i'd be yeah. delighted to answer them. thank you as well uh yeah we really heard uh really di like different si scenarios what can happen with the work uh like really from this uh preservation or collecting perspective and uh, uh yeah i have a couple of questions but uh, uh michael uh, was had no go ahead go ahead uh, oh, go ahead yeah. Uh, Dusha. Yeah. Okay, I <clears throat> I wondered about the scraped work, uh, this post apocalypse. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> do you still, or uh, or if you are a co-author, co co do you still consider it uh, the same work, or uh, do you, <clears throat> because you showed this picture that you would you present uh, this uh, scraped version in a gallery setting, uh, or or is it <clears throat> or is it a different work? Because uh, if if it's the same work, it's really interesting uh, kind of take on this idea <laughs> of iteration and uh, kind of uh, thinking about artworks through versioning. Yeah, yeah. So uh, actually, uh, we 
uh, when we uh, pressed this original work, so we pressed the sculptures, computers, entire stuff, uh, we decided to actually, you know, build another work over the result. So it is not the same. Uh, we uh, actually uh, experimenting with this new form. So we, for example, we are building another components, you know, over there. I remember once we presented this work in a gallery in Zielona Góra, which is quite regional, but very, very good gallery in Poland. We built a special, um, let's say, uh, machine learning systems, which was uh, fitted with text about, uh, let's say, apocalypse of arts from iconoclasm, you know, to any contemporary versions. And that was, um, it was generating this, you know, never ending uh, narration about the end of the art. So we are actually playing with that. It's a process um, and it's actually, we, we, we are not, also we are not planning to keep in this process forever. Actually, we, for now we are thinking about some kind of, you know, grand finale, I don't know, maybe explosion or something. But we are not really attached to this to this form. Yeah, I mean it's. Uh, uh, I mean, like we can also read it as a criticism of uh, like the whole uh, kind of museum system that uh, since uh, no museum or no collector wanted it or was able to take it over, like this is <laughs> this is what happened to the. Uh, to the to the artwork. Mm -hmm. So uh, please let me explain one thing. Maybe this is important okay. because I don't want to uh, I don't want to criticize. Uh, I think uh, how we interpret uh, this situation in the team. It was like uh, rather in a. This is actually question of resources. So we are living in the society with limited resources, and it's touching art too. So uh, I think there was really, really, you know, many people engaged in uh, producing this work with very good intention. That was just a problem of, of resources. This political situation was not helping us, of course, but it is uh, another issue. So basically, I, I, probably on that field, I'm quite near to Misha because I also believe that even if we cannot preserve some uh, uh, artworks forever, the, the, the trials, the checks, the, our attempts are very valuable because that is something which makes us uh, actually, you know, better. So uh, and I'm not saying about this, let's say, narcissistic uh, idea that I want other people to preserve my works because, for example, what, for what creates me as media artists was uh, archive from Vro Art Center. I was spending, you know, entire nights during a years watching all the documentations, and that was the best way for education I can imagine. So I, I, I really believe in these attempts. I really believe that the system uh, of museums, archives, institutions is very valuable, but still we can find some cases which are not passing the systems and which are very interesting. So, you know, that is my piece to my stone to the garden. Yeah, Michael, uh, maybe the good time to step in. Well, basically, uh, it, it, it is pretty impressive. Uh, I'm pretty impressed by, by this, uh, especially the one where you, uh, because it was not, nobody wanted the piece. You transform it into a, you metamorphose it into a, another dimension, and I think this is very smart and very creative and um, gesture. And uh, it looks like I know that the institutions are looking for some, let's say, uh, better and better and universal approach to preservation. This is also why we are here together, uh, right? 
But uh, at the end, uh, it looks like, even now for me, this is a conclusion a little bit from this session, and I'm learning. It's not just, I'm really learning also from you to see what is possible, and it's really I impressive. And also the case with, uh, by the way, with uh, Ken Feingold's works is uh, really in interesting and sad, of course, uh, that it seems like uh, the museum sh should probably... Uh, you know, probably every museum or everybody who collects and would like to preserve so-called media art will have, uh, will be an expert, will be specific expert. It will depend on the people and the constellation of manpower and creativity and also artistic imagination, how to do it. So, so, uh, I guess at the end it will be like, you know, uh, in Japan you have a uh, uh, very different uh, concept of uh, small restaurants where there are just uh, thousands of restaurants in Tokyo and each cook something else. So I guess every museum will have its own recipes and it will be almost like alchemy. You know, and it will be uh, like, a, uh, it will, there is probably, it's stupid to write a book, uh, how to preserve uh, uh, media art, because you can apply it, of course, to, to certain and uh, kind of works for sure. But in general, probably you have to look for your own strategies and, and creative uh, resources around yourself and try also unusual ways to do it. But of course, I understand it's very difficult as an institution to get cash from the, uh, from the tax and they want, uh, you know, that it's used in a proper way. And generally it's in a very conservative or in, in, uh, even naive way. And it probably doesn't, uh, it, it, it will take a time till politicians and other uh, institutional uh, infrastructures will recognize that you, you apply very different uh, maybe strategies and methods to, to to go there and you leave this idea, I preserve painting, so I uh, clean it and I, you know, it doesn't work here. It doesn't work. And I just remember also last one more thing. In I, I forgot to mention this, you know, National Gallery of Prague is one piece of my, which was landed to that camp to my retrospective. And it came completely almost destroyed. And we, 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 I started, of course, I, I was lucky there were people in that camp and also I put my own money to look in, 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 in uh, eBay for small monitors and the same even piece, he, the another piece, which is similar using similar technology, it's all from the late 80s, early 90s, video sculptures, uh, even ZKM at the end, they helped me, but also I had to help to have own initiative. So it's even combination. It's not that they take care of nine. No. So it's always individual conditions where I was into it to help to preserve it. And at the end, we ask in Prague, we restore it. It's very time consuming, cost money. Would you at least to pay for the transport back? They said, no. You understand? They said, no. So I said, okay, I. it's not fair deal. They got much more than they spend and they still didn't do it. So it's like very in every every case of restoration is highly individual and it's highly you have to be inventive, lucky, and sometimes you have more luck, bad luck, and there is no a rule. I, I don't believe that in this field there is a rule how to be better. You can learn something, I'm sure we learn now from each other here. And I'm very happy to be, I was actually, I thought what I'm doing, I'm probably the wrong person to be in this circle because I have nothing, uh, but now I see it's it's interesting. Uh, and it's, uh, I will even those experience I, I have a year with you share with others because I think it's really, uh, really uh, an endless story. And it's something almost be, it's also probably uh, somehow restoration is almost to make it's, maybe I would make an analogy to translation. You know, when you translate literature, you have to be lit, uh, able in a, on a literary, you have to be a writer, good writer at the end. So you have to be, if you are restoring, you have to be somehow a create, highly creative. You know what I mean?
So it's not just about administration and some rules, of course, as well, but also some highly imagina imagination. Yes, yes, this is this is this I would say is really at the kind of core of this uh, uh, almost a paradigm shift within uh, art conservation milieu, which uh, really started to unfold uh, maybe in the 90s, when uh, I mean traditionally this field is uh, uh, kind of uh, almost a scientific field, so it's uh, there is a lot of chemistry, there is uh, maybe some physics. But uh, yeah, when it comes to the material like uh, oil painting and uh, 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 like a bronze or marble sculptures, uh, you really need to kind of base your decisions in a, uh, in a kind of scientific uh, terms. So this profession, like professionals, conservators, they, <clears throat> they were never kind of led to have uh, uh, kind of free choice uh like to, to to have a to have a freedom to interpret interpret the works and uh <clears throat> this this started to change in uh in 90s when uh, more and more collections were facing these uh questions especially with installation art uh that uh you know like they would they would have a kind of uh, a size specific sculpture in uh, carolyn murray museum and they needed to move it from one place to another and uh, suddenly like a whole set of questions emerged like uh, what, actually how, how to do it or there was an example of um, uh, what's his name ah solevit uh, solevit did uh, did some kind of a uh, wall uh, work uh, it was painted on the wall uh, i'm not sure whether it was for steadily or some other museum in in netherlands and uh, they needed to kind of move the work uh, <laughs> or uh, from one wall to another and again like uh, questions emerge like okay who is actually uh, allowed to repaint the work by Solevit who is uh, I think by then he, he was dead and uh, so so from from these kind of questions uh, in Netherlands uh, uh, there emerged there was a big conference in like late 90s where people from abroad, from many institutions came and uh, really started to openly discuss these uh, basically questions of uh, restoration of uh, of uh, of uh, modern contemporary art. And and from then on, uh, th this idea of a change uh, as a necessary condition of a certain kind of works uh, kind of began to be embedded in this conservation milieu. And uh, I, I spent, I myself spent a couple of years uh, kind of doing uh, doctoral research in this uh, uh, environment in Netherlands, together with, uh, we had uh, like different museums uh, from UK, Germany and the States as, as partners. And for me, my, I mean, personally, it was a complete new world and I was uh, quite astonished, uh, like to what uh, kind of level this uh, got in places like Tate or MoMA or Guggenheim where they really have like uh, departments uh, employing uh, two to 11 people uh, who are, uh, let's say, who came to, to this field from sculpture conservation, from uh, uh, from painting uh, conservation from, uh, we had Patricia last time, uh, a week ago, who I think was educated as a furniture restorer. But uh, because there is a need for this uh, expertise, so they kind of learned on the go and uh, built it up. And at the moment, there are <clears throat> there are a couple of programs. There is one in uh, Switzerland in Bern. There is uh, one in New York University. There are maybe five, four or five MA programs uh, focusing on media conservation. And these uh, students are kind of uh, you can focus on software-based art conservation. You can focus on uh, uh, there are already PhD uh, writ PhDs written about performance art uh, conservation. Uh, there are, uh, yeah, another like uh, different uh, practitioner researchers focusing on digital art conservation. So, so there is this maybe new generation of art uh, conservators kind of emerging because there is a need for them. But uh, and then they are also developing these kind of techniques and uh, kind of conceptual frameworks for for these kind of works. But really like you uh, addressed it really i mean this is is really about uh, accepting change and uh, uh, and this kind of uh, finding uh, this a uh, place between uh, 
like the, the scientific grounding of the profession of, of conservation and and this uh, freedom to interpret the artistic uh, uh, choices behind each work and 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 restore the works in into these different uh, versions so that's uh, yeah that that's really something that is really at the heart of of these efforts to collect these kind of works um yeah i i, I yeah uh, i just wish that we would <laughs> we would have also people from last uh, from our previous session present here because i think it would also open up for interesting discussion uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway uh, yeah I, i'm sure we will also have opportunity in the future uh, to have more of a interesting uh, exchange between uh, uh, maybe people from that field and uh, uh, you as uh, practicing artists but uh, Attila, you had uh, uh, you had a comment or question? Uh, comment. <laughs> yes, I remember that was around uh, ninety, uh, and with old art, not contemporary or um, new media. When uh, the Sixtian Chapel, uh, Michelangelo's famous uh, frescoes were uh, um, actually cleaned. Uh, that was the Japanese method. That uh, the frescoes were washed a special method cleaned off the, the, the dirt and it was a shocking experience for the shock effect for the art lovers and the intellectuals and so on because it looked brand new it, <laughs> such a pinky colors and uh, such colors uh, appear uh, and the uh, dirt removed that uh, uh, it uh, maybe okay. Michelangelo uh, was dead. Nobody could a ask him <laughs> about the opinion on what to do with the frescoes. But uh, the the time, what is important? Yeah, this uh, few uh, centuries, it disappeared because it was made just yesterday. And uh, so it's very, very, very problematic with the uh, old art too. Sometimes in some cases, uh, and uh, and what Mihai said that uh, we should leave the works more open, or with a more open approach, the museum should uh, approach them. Uh, every artist know at the creation, uh, especially at the installation art, uh, that sometimes we use what we have around. It doesn't matter this lamp or that lamp or this, uh, I don't know what kind of materials. It could have been an other one if that is in the surrounding. So it's uh, just the material part. Uh, and uh, if the idea, uh, what is the core, uh, core, core of the work uh, can live, uh, then uh, I think uh, new materials, other materials can be uh, embodied in the, into the older work. I'm not against. <laughs> it, yeah, it's really, it's, yeah, yeah, I would say it's also really, it's really like, depends on the artist. So uh, among uh, these uh, conservators, they, they would they would describe uh, these artists, these artist approaches. Some artists would uh, have, uh, they would call it the thick. Uh, description of their artwork, so very, very detailed expectations what the artwork should be, uh, how it should be maintained, uh, and kind of control over how it's presented. And there are artists who uh, tend to have uh, more like a thinner <laughs> description who say, okay, this is the work, uh, I, I, I trust you completely, do what you want uh, almost uh, with it, and uh, you are a professional institution, we we give it to your hands. So yeah, I, yeah, it's also a lot about kind of the, the maybe attitude of the artists and, and their um, and of conception of, of how the work should be maintained. Mm. And of course, there is also a lot of negotiation. And uh, uh, as we as we heard, uh, the like uh, technical and financial possibilities, which are often more than limited. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, but that was really uh, great to hear from all of you. Uh, I would really encourage maybe also students uh, or and other participants to uh, maybe enter conversations since we only have a few minutes left. <clears throat> Do not hesitate. We are here for you. <clears throat> yeah, Jakub, uh, Jakub, what do you what do you think? Shall we still? Uh... I think if there are no no questions from the from the audience, uh, and there are no other topics that you want to discuss uh, in this. Uh, unique opportunity when we all are here together. Um, I think uh, we can wait for one more minute, and if no one, uh, no one uh, asks a question, uh, I think we can finish this session. And I would like to invite you to uh, the last session of this course, uh, which will focus on. Uh, the perspective of an artwork uh, in the new media art archiving, and this will uh, this will be on I believe 29th of October, so in two weeks. Yes, 29th Friday, uh, again at 2 p.m. and will it will also last two and a half hours, so until half past four. So. Um, we invite you all to participate. Uh, in case you're interested, you will find uh, the session on the same link as this one. Um, yeah, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank you all. Thank uh, to all the guests and thanks Dushan for the moderation of the debate. And I hope to see you soon. Uh, hopefully in the collections of uh, different <laughs> museums around the world and most hopefully in our collection too. <laughs> thank you very much. Goodbye. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.